six weeks flew by just like that. I remember we watched this video the, after the first week, I think, and I was like, whoa, we still have five more weeks. And now we're done. Um, and we had a wonderful closing ceremony right here last Friday. Yeah. Um, and we had over 100 people in this room, I think, with students, families, all the teachers and staff and volunteers. So this room was packed. Um, but to all the parents who are here with their kids who uh, came to summer camp, thank you again for entrusting your kids to us. And I hope um, they all had a wonderful time because I know all of us teachers and staff, we really um, had such a fun six weeks together. Um, and I just want to share a little bit personally, I guess, from um, my side of things, how the summer went. Um, personally, it was a very challenging six weeks. Um, I've done the summer camp the past three years, two years, I don't know how many, three years we've done it. But this year was definitely one of the most challenging ones for me. But um, through it all, I really learned that I can't do any of this on my own, and that's okay because um, we have a God who, we serve a God who is faithful through everything. And so I learned really to trust in Him and completely rely on Him for everything. And through everything, I I really appreciated everyone's support and encouragement. All the teachers, the staff, all my friends and family. Um, I just really felt everyone's support and love through um, it all. So thank you again to everybody, and I hope to see you again this year. <laughs> Yeah, the world just cannot express my thanks to Melissa to <coughs> run this camp so well, especially the first three weeks I wasn't here, we were in Taiwan. And this year we have a record breaking number. Last year we, because the construction not done yet, we only have less than 20 kids. This year, some on the peak time we have like 46, right? 43. So at least like 40 kids and also a lot of TA, alright? So really, really, we really, really, I'm so pleased and the entire church really so thankful for the work we have done, especially many TAs, you know, that uh, do a lot of work, do a lot of cleanings. I hope your mom we very your mom and dad very appreciate you can do that at home too, right? <laughs> so <laughs> So this is a great group effort together for us. So yeah. And uh, this is all the season for back to or started college. So, uh, but before that, I want to have two people share the testimony. <laughs> Last week we had uh, Margaret and Jonathan, right? Especially uh, today we're going to have uh, Lynn and Annie. They, they were in the mission team, and I heard their testimony during the mission trip. I think it's great. So I wanted. To to share with you before they go to college. So, oh, any first? Where's any? Any? Where's any? All right. I mean, not heard that red notebook. Me too. <laughs> we decided before this that we will go first, but I guess I'm here. Yeah, so I actually lost my voice from summer camp, so um, just bear with me. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is the uh, testimony that I shared with my kids in Taiwan about how I got to know God, and it's really personal to me, but I felt like after, first of all, in the gospel class in um, boot camp, I really didn't want to share it, and I was really nervous too. And they chose like five random people, and some people were like, no, I'm not ready. But then when the, the last person they chose me, and I just, I don't know, I felt like God telling me, like giving me strength to just do it. So I did it in front of like strangers that I just met, like telling stuff that I hadn't told to my closest friends. Um, and God really gave me strength through it, and I cried through it. But <laughs> Um, it gave me a lot of experience to share it, so then um, I could share it with my children and uh, my kids in Taiwan more easily, and also as I come back, um, I find that I'm sharing my testimony with all, a lot of my friends too. So I was nervous about coming up here and doing it, but I felt like if I did it with these people already, um, I should be 
that, you know, scared to do it up here. So, yeah, this is my testimony. Um, so, my mom first brought me to church when I was four. And um, when I was four, I guess, I always liked staying with my dad better because he was the one who was always, you know, like, relaxed and not worried about stuff. And my mom was more about, like, the strict one and the one who would, you know, tell me to clean my room and tell me to do, like, this work. So I think staying with my dad better. But um, a lot of people, a lot of kids might feel the same way. But, um, so that's the way I felt when I was four. And, um, but when I was four, I, me and my mom, just me and my mom, we moved to a one bedroom apartment in New York because um, it was right after my parents divorced. So um, I remember our neighbors, our new neighbors were always so surprised when we told them, like, I think they thought it was unusual for Asian families um, for this family situation. Um, and we were sort of alone in that area. Um, but soon my mom remarried, so I got a new stepdad and we moved into a suburban Jewish white neighborhood. Um, and it was so different from what we were used to. Like we moved from Flushing to Great Neck. So we, we felt like we really stuck out, but we stuck out together, so we stayed with each other because we pretty much only had each other and our memories. And my new stepdad was still really a stranger to me, and I was hesitant to accept him as part of my family. And I did call him dad. So me and my mom, we sought out our community together, and we found um, this church back when it was still at the hotel. And um, it's actually where we found other families like ours. Um, and when I was younger, every Sunday morning, I would just, you know, sit next to all the parents and moms and people, just like standing up and worshiping God, singing songs of praise, and they were always praying to someone named God, and I really did know who God was. They always were talking about God, and I really just didn't know what they were talking about. So as the months passed, um, the strangers in the church became some of our closest friends, and the church really became our sanctuary. Um, and as I got older, um, I realized one thing that I started to go to church, um, not because of God, really. Um, I realized that I started going to church for my friends, and uh, like I would stay after church um, to talk with my friends, because I wanted to talk with my friends on, um, on Sunday, and my mom would go home first. Um, and I was so happy, because I didn't want to talk to my mom, I wanted to talk with my friends, and I feel like, um, that's, that's an issue that maybe some of us struggle with, like not knowing why we go to church and our purpose here. Um, but anyway, so I like to stay after and escape my mom. And at that point, I was still wasn't, like I didn't have a good relationship with my dad or my mom. Like my mom and I fought all the time and I didn't really call my dad dad. Um, so, when I started high school, I felt like my mom put a lot of pressure on me to do well on tests and to succeed. Like this is like the you know the immigrant story. I moved all the way from China to America so they could get a better education, and she like worked all the time also just so she could provide for me to pay for school. And so I thought that if I studied really hard and I thought if I got all like A's and great grades. Then my mom would stop fighting and stop yelling with me, and most importantly, I thought my mom would start paying attention to me because that's what I kind of really wanted. Um, because she was really like the only one um, who I could like turn to for help because I wasn't that close with my stepdad. So um, because I wanted to study really hard. Um, 
a lot of times I stop going to church on Sundays, and I use the excuse that I was studying and um, I was preparing for tests, so I, I couldn't, I, I didn't have like one or two hours to spare on Sundays. And I thought my plan worked, so I thought I got really high test scores and um, I got into college and I thought it worked, but really still I realized my mom and I barely talked and she was always working and I felt like there's nothing I could do for her to feel proud of me and um, all I really wanted was a good relationship with my parents and with my mom and to feel love um, and I felt really alone and I felt really heavy burdens and I questioned why I was studying so hard why I was doing all these things for school and like getting high grades, but why did I still feel so empty inside? And I felt really angry inside as well. So my mom and I fought pretty much every day at one point, and usually it ended in me crying and locking myself in my room. Like every day, <laughs> I'm slamming the door. And um, I was so angry to just talk to my mom sometimes, and I would yell back too. And um, our relationship there wasn't very good. Like we never talked about deeper things. Like we never talked. She never told me about the divorce, and I was still confused. And I don't know. I I felt very alone and sort of unloved. So I I felt a lot of hurt and sadness in my heart too because. It was that one relationship that I had with my mom, who is the most important person in my life, and it was the one relationship that I really wanted to succeed, but instead, it was totally the opposite because I couldn't even talk to her without being angry and feeling hateful inside. So, I was pretty much very broken inside, um, and to get her attention, um, I guess I constantly rebelled, so like I would stay out late, um, sometimes without her permission. Um, I let some not so great friends control me sometimes, and I did sin. Um, and I also wanted to be treated like an adult, so I stopped asking for her help. I said, I don't want your advice. I, I didn't listen to any of her advice, and in fact, sometimes I did the opposite. So it got to a point where I hadn't been to church in like a few months and my mom only talked to me to sort of criticize me. Like we didn't really talk at that point. We lived in the same house, but we barely spoke to each other. Um, the most it would be was just to be like, clean your room. Um, and I cried a lot and I didn't really know what to do because even when I tried to speak to her, I just felt a lot of hate in my heart and at one time it was like uh, the tensions were like at an all time high. I think it was during my college application process which was a very stressful time for us um, and I even told her that I hated her which was something that I never thought would happen. Um, and I definitely regret now, but because um, I, I don't know, I just felt a lot of hate in my heart and I didn't know how to handle it. And that's not something that I ever want to hear like a child telling their mom, you know. So, so one day my mom asked me to go to church and um, a church retreat, which was the winter retreat in like two years ago, like 2016, the first one. And I remember, of course, I refused, um, and I was like, why would I want to go to this? Um, but then I remembered that if I went, I could escape my mom for a few days. So, um, so of course, I just thought, um, maybe I could hang out with some, reconnect with some old friends, and maybe I could just stay in my room and be on my phone or do, like, um, homework or something. Um, so I decided, yeah, I'll give it a try, I'll go. But again, I wasn't going for God. I was going to escape my mom. I was going to reconnect with my friends. And um, so that's what I thought I would do. I thought I would just stay in my room. But um, something 
made me go listen to one of the testimonies. Actually, some, some of my old friends told me to go listen to this testimony um, that uh, my old Sunday school teacher was giving, who was Jing Jing. Uh, a lot of you know Jing Jing. And um, so I went to this testimony, and she talked about, Jing Jing talked about um, her relationship with her mom. And um, I thought that was really interesting because I sort of never really asked about other people's relationship with their family, even though now that's pretty much um, one of the first things I do uh, with people, like trying to you know, get to really know each other. But uh, this is the first time I really heard about um, someone's really personal relationship with their mom. Like it wasn't always, you know, perfect all the time. That's what I thought. Like other people's relationship with their mom was. Um, so anyway, um, they she talked about how they didn't really talk that much, and that their situation was very similar to mine. About like how even when they were living in the same house, that they weren't they weren't you know even like in contact with each other most times. And she told me about how she moved to her grandparents' house for a time, and that, like, and that she did have a lot of, you know, dark and uh, low times, and that it made me realize that it was okay for me to feel this way sometimes. But she basically told us how the story of how God really worked in her life, and that it, it wasn't like a fast improvement. But like it was more like a, a slow crawl up the mountain, where um, where slowly God was able to come back into her life, um, and she was slowly able to accept that back into her life, and slowly go to church again, um, and and so when she started crying on stage, and then um, I felt like a rush of sort of like emotion in my heart. And I started to cry, but I didn't really know why. And I looked around me, and pretty much everyone was crying around me. And I really didn't know why at all. Um, and it wasn't until a few weeks later where I realized uh, why so many people were crying, why I was crying, mainly. Um, so I wasn't crying because I was sad. Um, or angry, like all the times I did before with my mom, um, I realized that I was crying because I, for the first time in my life, really, I felt like I wasn't alone. Um, not just in the aspect that, like, uh, other people had relationships with their mom that were similar to mine, but also that I felt that I could talk to God, and He was always there, even when. I felt like I was alone. He was always there, right next to me. Um, like every single time I cry, um, there's uh, a pastor in Advent in Taiwan who used to say, every single time you cry, God is standing right next to you. And and when he and he says, like, imagine if you get to heaven and God just hands you this vial and it's filled with water. And he said, these are your tears. I was next to you every single time you were crying. And I want to be there for you, and I was there for you. So um, I realized I was not alone, and I realized I felt the unconditional love that I felt like I it was missing from my mom and my dad. Um, but then he also helped me realize that I did have love in my life. I did have my parents, um, but ultimately. I found a fatherly and a motherly love from God, and uh, I realized that God has the authority to forgive all sin, and He sent His Son not to die for those people who are perfect, who who are righteous, but He sent His Son to die for the sinners. And I just have to realize that I am a sinner, and we are all sinners, and that's why God's love is so great because He is able to forgive all of that. And I think through that experience, I started to discover what real love was, and um, and I know what love is because 
love is when Jesus died for all of our sins. Um, and we are so unworthy, and I've sinned so much, um, but God still loves me um, today. He loved me yesterday, and he'll also love me tomorrow. And he's this constant thing in my life that I feel will never change. And he's a doctor who healed my broken heart. And so slowly, just like Jing Jing, um, it wasn't very fast um, because it's still happening right now, but um, our relationship has improved. And um, now me and my mom start talking about like even deep stuff. Um, like she comes to me with her problems and I come to her with my problems and she's the rock that I return to time and time again, even though we still fight a lot. Um, like last night. <laughs> but, um, so she finally told me about the divorce, about why she had it, why she didn't want me to see my real dad anymore. Um, and she told me a lot of her problems and I can be there for her. And so slowly we started um, coming to church together as a family and feeling like um, even though there's so many things that are blocking us from God, like maybe our family situation, maybe our friends, maybe her work, that we can still really come to church and let it heal us every Sunday and still feel that even when we go home. So even though there's a lot of days on which I still contact with my mom and I still fight with her, at least I know that God is always with us. And whenever that happens, the first thing I do is pray to God. And even if it takes a few hours or a few days, like um, I really see how God has played an incredible role in my life in uh, fixing this relationship and mending it and restoring it time and time again. And I feel like having faith in the Lord really did that. Um, just trusting Him that He has this amazing power um, to perform miracles, basically. And through my journey um, with my mom, through um, this whole story, I think that I finally really found God's true love. So thank you. Like, hi, 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 welcome, you can't have the food and everything. 
And um, I was not like that. I was like a loud, rowdy child that just liked to run around and everything. So um, from a young age, I feel like there were certain times when I feel like something like wasn't enough. Like I didn't fit into the way that um, I didn't fit in into the way that I should be. Um, there were expectations that I could be that I didn't be. And um, growing up, it was basically like this. So basically, it was just this journey of always not meeting my expectations, whether it was in school, in piano, um, in ballet. Um, um, so like that was my life essentially. And then I reached middle school. And then um, once you reach middle school, there are a lot of things that happen essentially. You go through a lot of changes, your friends change, um, your priorities change. Um, and when your priorities change, sometimes your expectations change too. So all of a sudden, I had to get good grades, I had to make new friends, I had to be both social and smart, and there was a lot to balance. And also around this time, also around this time I injured my ankles, so I used to do ballet and I was getting on. Hold on. <laughs> I used to do ballet and I was getting on since when I was young, and I injured my ankle and the doctor said she can't do ballet and I was getting anymore. And this is what I know growing up, so I was like, oh no, I can't do it, I'm going to be bad at something again. And then around this time I found swimming. Um, swimming was really fun at first because there were goals in swimming. And in swimming it's like you have certain cuts to make and certain times to have. So when you reach that time, you're like, oh my god, I feel like I feel so accomplished. And all of a sudden, it was not just me having expectations, it was me having expectations and reaching those expectations. So all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm doing well. I can, like, I can figure out what I'm doing with my life. Um, but then it, was, it, it got harder because this woman, Evan probably knows, there are people who start when they're like six, seven. And when they start when they're six, seven, by the time I got injured when I was 12, I injured my ankle, and that's when I started swimming because it was like better on the ankle. So when you start swimming that late, it's really hard to catch up to people who have been swimming when they were really younger. So no matter how much I tried, no matter how much I practiced, I still couldn't reach people who were who started swimming much earlier. And I think everyone who saw me then was like, you're such a hard worker, you go to practice six days a week. I used to go to practice early to open up the pool, stay the latest to close the pool, I would be dry lands at practice, I would come home and do my own dry lands. I was very fit back then, that was the only thing that was good at this. Um, I, so I, I tried really hard, like Saturday mornings I remember waking up at like crack of dawn, like when it was still dark and the birds hadn't even started chirping in, just going to practice at 6 a.m. Um, but it seemed like whatever I did, my times weren't good enough because I was comparing myself to people who had started swimming when they were 6, 7, and I started swimming when I was 12, whole six years later. But for me, like, that logic didn't register with me, and I just kept thinking, why am I not good enough? What am I doing that's wrong? And you sort of feel very alone when that happens. So my mom used to be like, why don't you smile? Like, what's going on? Is something wrong at school? And all I could say was, no, mom, nothing, everything's fine. But she didn't know that internally, I felt really alone. And I felt like I wasn't good enough. Um, so that sort of went on and on. And it's not like I wasn't excelling. Like, I was getting all A's in school, like very high A's, actually. I got into the high school of music for pre-college. Like, there were many accomplishments in my life, and I was just so blinded because I couldn't see that. And every day, it was like, I'm not, I'm doing something wrong, I'm doing something wrong, I'm not, oh, why did I get a 94 instead of 100 on this test? Why did, why am I not swimming the cuts that I should be swimming? Why is everyone so much faster? Why can't I make the time today in the set? Why did everyone else my lady make the time for the set? And I think as Asian kids, like, we don't mean for this to happen, but in our families, often, um, as Asian parents, they don't tend to be 
congratulatory. And it's nothing wrong with um, my parents. My parents are great. But in general, just in the Asian society, we don't tend to say, like, good job, how was your day? Like, we don't, we don't hug it out often. We don't, um, it's just not our culture. Like, we don't, we don't go to, like, I, I remember seeing all my American friends, they would go up to their parents at swimming, they would cheer really loudly after every race, like, good job! And, and then, um, I just, I think my, my family isn't like that. So then, through this, I felt really alone. And then, so this, apparently, it's just like exponentially sinking lower into a hole, but eventually goes up, right? So that time period when it turned up was at bronze championships. So, and it's going to laugh at me because my time is really slow. But um, during that time, I was living a 116 for 100 free. And um, my coach said to me before I went up for this race that I had to swim a 110 for 100 free. And as a 14, 13, 14 year old, it's not that fast. But for me to drop six seconds in 100 free is. 100 free for those of you who know, it was like four laps in the, in the short pool, so you go one, two, three, four. It's very hard to drop even like two seconds on 100 free when you're going at your max. And I thought I had to take my maximum speed. So I joked with my friends before going up there. I said, haha, the slowest I can swim is a 109.99, right? And then everyone's like, yeah, haha, that's so funny, blah, blah, blah. Like, because everyone, I, I told everyone that there was no way I was going to make this time. Because in my mind, I had already pegged myself as someone who can't reach my expectations. Someone who like, like I already tried all this, and I already know. I was going up to the house, I was like, I know. I'm not gonna get this time, I'm just gonna just swim. And for some reason, before I went on that day, I had prayed. And I don't often pray before my swim races. I do now, but I didn't before. And I don't know why God said, just pray, so I prayed. And I said, God, I know, I don't really pray often, this is really weird to ask, but can I just please swim under 110 so my coach doesn't like, I feel like if I disappointed my coach, like that was a huge failure. Like for me, I had placed my value in those swimming times. And if I did not get this time, I was like, my life is over. Like if I don't get this time, then my life is going to be over. And I just really wanted to swim that time. And I went to the black and I just go and I just swim. And I don't remember the race at all. I just remember the wash, water rushing through my ear, um, ears, sort of oh, my cap, and just flip turning onto the last race. And I remember my legs just burning. That's all I remember from the race. But when I slammed this wall and I looked up, the time was a 109.99. And I don't, <laughs> there are not many miracles in my life, but that is one of those. And 
I know it's really cliche to say this, but um, I think God is really influential in it because when I, so as Jonathan probably will tell you, I'm going to Harvard University in September, and that is a very great school. moment to dedicate these young people as they prepare for a new journey in their life. Lord, we want to thank you for Annie and Lynn's testimony, knowing that even while we are not aware that you are around us, you are always there. We just want to thank you that you love them with an unfailing love and you will be with them when they need you in the darkest hour in this new journey. I pray that your wisdom will guide them, they will not rely on their own strength but they will learn from your works. They will dedicate their life and their study into your hand, knowing that you have a wonderful plan in their life. We just want to thank you in the name of Jesus. We pray thanks. Amen. 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 